Alright, so tonight uh, for Genesis Bible Study, we are in chapter 17, so if you have your Holy Bibles, why don't you open up and follow along. We're continuing the story of Abraham, or at this time he was still known as Abram, but I believe it's this chapter where his name is finally going to get changed to Abraham. Uh, we've been dealing with Abraham since chapter 11 or 12, I believe, so... If you haven't seen the past Bible studies, I'd recommend going back and watching those first, starting with, I believe, chapter 11 or chapter 12, and then uh, make your way up to this Holy Bible study, because that way you can get the whole picture of Abram and his life so far. But let's jump right into it here, because it looks like a pretty long chapter. Verse 1, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be you perfect. All right, so Abram was 99 years old. And he still had not had that promised seed yet that the Lord said would come forth from Sarai's loins. So at this point, you really got to give Abraham credit. And that's why I think his faith is a model for our Christian faith, and St. Paul digs that in, simply because, I mean, 99 years, and he received the promise decades upon decades ago from the Lord, he still kept the faith in that promise. It's a lesson for all of us. It doesn't matter if, if what you're praying for takes a month, a year, two years, five years, ten years. If Abram could wait decades to see a promise fulfilled, and until he was 99 years old, I think we can give God the benefit of the doubt that he knows what's right. And what we're praying for, what we're hoping for, will come in his time. And it's always the right time. Okay, and the Lord here appeared to Abram. This wasn't in a vision. This wasn't just a voice. He appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. And I believe there that the translation is El Shaddai, the Mighty God. Walk before me and be you perfect. So even after the Lord had known Abram, Abraham for decades, he's still letting him know what he wants from him. He wants to walk with him. He wants Abram, Abraham to follow his commands, to do what he says is right, to stay away from what he says is wrong, and to be perfect. Even Lord Jesus said that. He said, your Father in heaven is perfect, so be you perfect. That's what they want from us, our God and our Lord in heaven. But we all know that's not possible in this sinful human flesh. So that's why we put our faith, our hope, and our trust in the perfect one. The only perfect being that ever walked planet earth, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. So in order for us today to walk before God and be perfect before him, we must 100% put all of our faith, hope, and trust in His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in the merits of what He did for us on His holy cross, shedding that sinless holy blood that us poor sinners can be reconciled unto the Father in heaven because of what He did, because of the blood He shed that didn't have to be shed, yet He shed it for us and for our sins. And by that, we, who are imperfect, unholy sinners, are made perfect holy and righteous in God's sight. And verse 2, I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. So again, God here is speaking of the covenant he's going to make with Abram. You notice he made one with Adam and Eve. He made one with Noah. He's going to make one with Abraham. And then he makes covenants with, I believe, Isaac and Jacob, Israel. Down the line, the Lord is big on covenant. He's making the covenant. Notice that it's not Abram making the covenant or coming to an agreement into a covenant with God. It's God himself is making the covenant. And that's what Lord Jesus Christ again did for us in the New Testament when he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that was shed for you and for all for remission of sins. Jesus himself made the covenant. There was nothing we could do. None of our good deeds can save us. Nothing we do, no rituals, no religious practices, it's simply by what Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross that confirms the covenant. And God himself, if you remember a few chapters back, he confirmed the covenant. When he walked 
in the midst of the sacrifices. And Abram was asleep. Abram did nothing. God did it all. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Two of the most important covenants. He says he's going to multiply him exceedingly. He's, he's already promised Abram this a couple times in his story. Verse 3, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. Abram fell on his face. I have done that so much in recent years in my walk with God. You know, well, growing up, we're taught in churches and stuff to pray like this or to do like this. I mean, kneeling's good. But the more and more I read about the men who had really strong relationships with the Lord and who really trusted the Lord and who were really close to the Lord, you'll notice they always fell on their faces. And so I've begun to do that in prayer when there's something I really need from the Lord. When I come before him in prayer, once in a while I'll just be kneeling before him, but most of the time, especially when it's something I really need, I put my face to the ground. Because that, that shows that you, the poor sinner, are completely, totally humbling yourself before the presence of Almighty God. And he deserves that, being as glorious and wondrous and just awesome as he is. He deserves us to acknowledge that awesomeness and that he is truly God, almighty God, El Shaddai. Abram fell on his face. God said, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. So, Abram is the father of the Jewish people, Israel, but he's also the father here of many nations. And I believe that's also because he was the father of Ishmael also, and Ishmael is going to become the father of twelve nations. So that's why I believe it says Abram is the father of many nations. Alright, neither shall your name any more be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Here it is, the name change finally, so I don't have to keep tripping up and calling Abram Abraham all the time. This is key, this isn't just a minor name change. Now, Abram originally meant I believe exalted father. Now Abraham means the father of many nations. You got to get this. When he was called exalted father, he really didn't have a son. So you got to figure when he's 90 years old walking around town and people are like, Abraham, Abraham. And they kind of maybe chuckled because his name meant exalted father, but he had no kids. I mean, excuse me, when they said Abram, Abram. But now when he's called Abraham, that's going to mean he's not only going to have a child, but he's going to have many children of many nations are going to come from Abraham, father of many nations. And one cool thing about the name Abraham and the name Sarah is, remember right now, Sarah's name is Sarai, S-A-R-A-I. Her name in this chapter is going to be changed to Sarah, S-A-R-A-H. Through studies, I've found that the H, the He, in Hebrew, is representative of the Holy Spirit. So God here, when he changes their names, is infusing himself into both of them. He's putting his spirit into their names, into their lives. So instead of Abram, now it's Abraham. And instead of Sarai, it's Sarah. Because he's putting his spirit in them. To show that they are his. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you and kings shall come out of you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto you and to your seed after you. This is what you want to get. I've said in past studies this chapter was coming. There are Muslims today. And Muhammad started the whole lie. That Abram is the father of the Muslims and Islam and everything else because he was the father of Ishmael. And so the Muslims, basically what they do is they change the Holy Bible like they do so many times, and they replace Isaac, whom God in our book chose, with Ishmael. And they say that Ishmael was the chosen son of Abraham, so he inherits the land, he inherits all the promises. It's not true. If you remember, we read St. Paul said, I believe it's in Galatians, if we Anyone preaching the gospel, anyone preaching the word of God. And remember, Paul was also a Jew, so he wasn't just preaching as a Christian, he was preaching as a Jew too, so he was preaching to both Jews and Christians. 
about the Word of God. If we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you other than the one that we have preached in this Holy Bible, any other gospel, St. Paul said, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. So if people may get mad at me when I curse Islam and I say it's evil and it's of the devil and Allah is a false god, he's Baal. There's a biblical reason for that. Because Muhammad says that he received his revelations, these new revelations about Ishmael and about Jesus not really, really being the Messiah, executioner of all Christians and Jews who refused to convert to Islam. Our God never said any of that. That's all antithetical to our word. And God said twice in the Holy Bible, once in the Old Testament in Exodus, and again in the book of Revelation, if you take from this word, or add unto it in any way, you shall be accursed. So, Muhammad not only took from it, but he added to it. And St. Paul said, if we are an angel from heaven, and again, Muhammad said it was an angel of heaven that brought him this revelation, these new revelations about the Holy Bible, about God, and what his word really says. What even more emphasizes that it was a false angel that revealed this to Muhammad was that witnesses say that when he received these so-called revelations, he foamed at the mouth and convulsed on the floor. What do we associate those two things with spiritually? Demonic possession. So yes, he may have received his new revelations from angels, but they were fallen angels. So, let me get down to what this all boils down to here, is that God is going to say, one of these children of Abraham, whether it be Ishmael or Isaac, is going to be the seed. The seed. They're not both the seed. People get that confused. They think just because it says the seed of Abraham, they think that it means all his children. It doesn't. God specifically singles out one child as the seed. We're going to find out who that is here. So whenever you see that word seed, pay attention to it. Because God said his covenant will be established with your seed after you. Not with all of your children. With your seed after you. To be a God unto you and to your seed after you. Notice God is emphasizing the word seed, seed, seed. So you can't get it twisted. You can't say, well, God really didn't mean that. He meant Ishmael too. Wait for it. And I will give unto you, and to your seed after you, and to your seed after you, the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, which would be the modern day nation of Israel, and then some. As I've said in past studies, modern day Israel is, I don't think, even 10% of what God had initially intended them to inherit. So they still have a lot more land to inherit. Meanwhile, the United Nations and American presidents and all the Arab nations are trying to, Europe, trying to take land away from Israel to give it to the Palestinians. When Israel doesn't even right now inherit all the land that they're supposed to. So if anyone today is occupying any land, it's Saudi Arabia, it's Egypt, it's Lebanon, it's Palestine, it's Jordan. They're all occupying land that God has said belongs to Israel. Israel's not occupying anything. They don't even have all the land they're supposed to have. So again, he's saying, your seed's going to inherit that land, the modern day land of Israel, for an everlasting possession. Get it? Everlasting. That means eternal, forever, never ending. Get it? All of you BDS protesters who say that Israel is occupying land. They're not occupying anything. It's their land. It's always been their land. It's going to always be their land. Everlasting, forever, forever, forever. Get that through your head and stop trying to fight God because you will lose every time. And I will be their God, the God of the Jews, the God of the Hebrews. I'm going to explain why in a second. And God said unto Abraham, You shall keep my covenant, therefore, you and your seed, you and your seed after you in their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep. Between me and you and your seed after you, every man child among you shall be circumcised. 
and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant between me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of your seed. He that is born in your house, and he that is bought with the money, must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh, for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of the foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Okay, so circumcision was a covenant between God and the Jewish people, which I believe they still keep today. But what's really cool here is the Holy Bible is ahead of science. So all the people who say that science trumps the Holy Bible. The Holy Bible explains science before science explains science. And you have to go back to my first couple Genesis chapter studies to understand that. But right here we find that eight days old shall be the day of circumcision. We find that the baby in the third day, in the fourth day, in the fifth day, it doesn't have the bodily makeup yet. It doesn't have the things necessary inside of its body in order to have a safe circumcision. It's not until the eighth day that the body and the internal things going on in your body are ready for a safe, healthy circumcision. You do it before that, you could lose the child. You do it after that, you're going to be in a lot of pain. You may still lose the child, but if you do it on the eighth day, that's the day everything's fully developed, and you will safely have a circumcision. Now, science has later on proved that. That's where I'm getting all this that I'm speaking of. The Bible doesn't say that. Science is saying that today, but the Bible said it in Genesis chapter 17, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years ago. All right, verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, you shall not call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah, with the H, with the H, shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give you a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Now people think here that Abraham is, Abraham is actually laughing at God like, like Sarah did. In a few chapters here, when God reveals that she's going to have the son in her old age, and she laughs. And then... Yahweh in the flesh, who was Lord Jesus at that time, who was with the angels, and they were communing and dining with Abraham, he said, why did she laugh? And she denied, she said, oh, I didn't laugh. So he condemned her when she laughed, but notice, God doesn't condemn Abraham when he laughs. So what I've read is, from the early rabbinical studies, is that Abraham here was laughing out of joy, because just this miraculous thing God was going to do for him. In her old age, she's going to bear a child? At 90 years old, and me, I'm almost 100 years old, I'm going to bear a child? Thank you. Hallelujah. You know, he's falling on his face, he's laughing, he's just so joyful. That's a different laughter from the laughter we're going to find from Sarah. I just want to distinguish the two. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. What he means there is, you know what, God? I know you have a way. I know you have a plan. But I'll tell you what, I mean, in all honesty, I'm about 100 years old, and Sarah, like I just said, she's 90. She doesn't want to go through childbearing right now. We're too old to raise a child right now. Just somehow, you know, maneuver your plan a little bit and make Ishmael the chosen seed, and then just let your promises flow through him. So Abram was saying, look, I've already got a son. He's 13 years old. Let him be the chosen seed instead of trying to bring a whole new child into the world at this time, at this late stage of our lives. How many of us do that today? We want something from God. And we get a little bit of it, but we don't want to wait to receive the whole thing. And we're just like, you know what, God? That sounds really great what you promised me in your word. Sounds really great. But you know what? What I have now, it'll do. I really don't want to, you know, go through the long, burdenous faith process and year after year and after year waiting for this thing to come into fulfillment. Why don't you just make what I have now 
the blessing you intend for me in the future. Just just somehow maneuver it. So, And we always get in trouble when we do that. Because if we try and make God's promise, which have, hasn't been fulfilled to us, fulfilled in our lives, in our own way, I've explained in some past studies, it never works out right. Never works out right. And sometimes we can usually screw it up and push God's promises and answer prayers further in the future if we try to make them come to pass now in a way God doesn't want them to. So Abram here was was about to make that mistake. But God said, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son indeed. And you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Get it. God saying, your son Isaac is who I'm going to establish my covenant with and his seed after him. What did God say in verse 7? My covenant, Abram, will be with you and your seed after you and in their generations for an everlasting covenant and to your seed after you. He's now saying the same thing of Isaac. Didn't say that to Ishmael. Abraham just asked if it could be Ishmael. God's like, no. It's going to be this guy named Isaac. Again, he is the forefather of the Jews and the Hebrews. Well, Abraham, Abram is the forefather of Jews and the Hebrews, but Isaac, his son, would become the father of Israel, who is otherwise known as Jacob. We're going to read about him later in Genesis. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him already and will make him fruitful. I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make of him a great nation. Meaning the, the nation of Arab peoples. They're going to be spread across the Middle East. Uh, twelve princes could mean twelve nations, whether that be you know, Egypt or Lebanon or Jordan or Yemen or, or whatever else, Palestine. He is going to have twelve kings that are going to stem from him, and they're all going to be the Arab world. That's his blessing. That's Ishmael's blessing. But my covenant, get it, this is God speaking to Abraham. My covenant will I establish with Isaac. That's verse 21. Look it up yourself. My covenant will I establish with Isaac, not Ishmael, which Sarah shall bear unto you at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Did you catch that? I mean, we've all had to make some sacrifices to walk with God in this life. Things that we do want and things that we don't want to do, we do for God. This is something I don't think any man on earth would ever want to do for anyone. But this man, Abraham, did it because of his faithfulness to God. And that's why his name is a name of renown and his, renown, and his name is made great to this very day. And Christians even in the New Testament are told to have a faith like Abraham because he, when he was almost 100 years old, think about it. It's painful for a child to be circumcised. You're not only a grown man, you're almost 100 years old, and now you're going to do a little snip snip. Women may not understand, but men know what I'm talking about. You even get nicked in that area of your body the wrong way, and it's, it's painful for minutes on end. But getting cut... In that old age, that is faith, my friends, a faith we need to all have. Verse 25, And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Now, we do serve the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, Yahweh God. But you got to remember, when the new covenant was made through the Lord Jesus Christ, he did away with animal sacrifices, and he did away with circumcision. That's strictly a Jewish thing, because all Jews can be Christians, but all Christians can't be Jews. Meaning that you have Messianic Christians, which are Jews who become Christians. 
but Christians can't become Jews. I mean, you can, you can convert, you can do whatever you want, but it's, it's, you're not really a Jew. That's, it's a race. It's a thing, it's from your forefathers, it's stemmed through your blood, you're a Jew. They are the ones who still keep the circumcision because it was an everlasting covenant with God. We Christians are not meant to do that. If you remember, God said, circumcise your heart. Circumcise your heart unto me. And that's what we're to do. We're to give our heart, our soul, our mind, our body, every ounce of our being, our spirit to God and to his Holy Spirit. And tonight I'm recording this in the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, in which the Holy Spirit came down upon Mary and upon the disciples and filled them all with the Holy Spirit. And they all spoke in foreign languages and tongues and understood one another. God, this weekend, wants to fill every single one of you listening to this with His Holy Spirit. Just like He put His Holy Spirit in Abraham's name. Just like He put His Holy Spirit in Sarah's name. He wants to put His Holy Spirit in all your names. He wants to put His Holy Spirit in all your hearts and your minds and your souls. That you would live for Him. That you would walk with Him. That you would be perfect for Him by your faith. In the Lord Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, who died so that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You believe that, you give your life to Jesus tonight. If you don't know Him already, just say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've been a sinner for a long, long time. I've been doing so many things that are against your word. And I've finally begun to realize that by watching these videos from Michael, by reading his articles, by reading his books, I don't want to be on the wrong side of the fence anymore. I want to come to you. I want to be washed and cleansed of all my sins, all my iniquities. I want to be healed of all my diseases. And I know only you can do that. So I, I surrender my life to you now. I surrender my mind, my body, my soul to you now, Lord Jesus. So that you may send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to fill me. And to show me the way in which I should walk. To be pleasing to our Father in Heaven. That I may be reconciled to Him through you. This evening, this holy feast of Pentecost and always. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, I pray it. And I beg for your forgiveness by thy blood which you shed for me on thy cross. Amen and amen. Friends, I hope you enjoyed this Bible study tonight. We're going to talk more about Ishmael and Isaac in the future. I'll probably touch on this subject some more, but just I hope you got it. God couldn't have drove it home any more in this chapter. Abraham seed, Abraham seed, Abraham seed, Abraham seed, Abraham seed, over and over and over again. He pounded that word in so that finally when that verse came, when he said, And your seed shall be Isaac. In your seed shall Isaac be called. Whatever translation you read, it's always seed is Isaac. It's not Ishmael. Islam is a lie. Muhammad was a false prophet. This book was written thousands of years earlier. This book is the truth. It's never been proven false. God is the God of Israel. He gives himself that title in this book. El Shaddai, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, is our God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who are one with their Holy Spirit as the true God forever and ever. So believe God. Believe this book. Believe that the Jews belong in that land where they're at today and that they belong in so much more land which God has promised them in the Middle East and they will have it someday because his word never fails never returns to him void it always does what he intends for and what he accomplishes it to do believe that so god bless israel god protect israel the descendants of isaac and hopefully may ishmael's descendants repent and turn to the true god of heaven and earth the god of this holy book which i hold tune in next week we're going to talk some more about abraham Genesis 18. And friends, until then, God bless y'all.